Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Casey Foreman, and I have a lot of different aspects, uh, you know, different areas of the NBA I want to discuss today. Uh, I want to start out by talking about Rajon Rondo, Averly Bradley, uh, both are not going to be playing for the Los Angeles Lakers. I want to talk about, you know, the effect it's going to have on that team. I also want to talk about, you know, the Orlando NBA bubble, uh, you know, that snitch, quote snitch, uh, hotline, anonymous hotline. Also want to talk about, you know, the overall quality of play we might see down in Orlando. Uh, you know, LaMelo Ball, one of the, uh, you know, this year is one of the top lottery picks. At least he's projected to be one of the top lottery picks. And I want to talk about where I think he might land in this year's draft. And then make sure you stick around until my very last segment. Uh, cause I want to talk about those Golden State Warriors again. And, you know, their trade for Andrew Wiggins this, this past season, as well as, you know, if they are in fact still contenders for the NBA title. Uh, so stick around until the very end of the show for that. But like I said, I want to start out by talking Los Angeles Lakers, uh, Averly Bradley, uh, Rajon Rondo, both uh, out for the Lakers. We know Averly Bradley, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, he, he let, you know, the Lakers know that he is opting out. He chose not to join the Lakers in Orlando. Uh, I believe his son has a respiratory uh, illness or, or, or uh, he, he's at a higher chance of, of getting the virus than, you know, a regular person would be. So, you know, Averly is, is uh, opting out to protect his family and his son. So, you know, power to him for doing that and making the right decision for him and his family. Rondo, a different story whatsoever and kind of the same kind of story with Rondo. You know, he he's hurt again. Uh, Rajan uh, broke his thumb in a practice. He's going to be out at least six to eight weeks. Uh, he had to leave the bubble to get surgery. We'll see when he can come back. Uh, but, you know, I think the Lakers are going to miss both guys, Rondo and Bradley. Uh, they were both pretty key pieces to the rotation, especially uh, Bradley. I, I, I've discussed that already, and, you know, Rondo is the latest piece of news. But, you know, both to have both of these guys out, both, like I said, being big parts of the rotation, it's going to affect the Lakers roster. Okay, let's talk about the two guys again. Uh, so Rondo this season, seven points, also five assists off the bench, about twenty, you know, about about twenty or so minutes a game. Uh, Bradley about eight and a half, nine points a game, same about twenty five minutes per game, maybe closer to the thirty, but you know, twenty five minutes per game. Uh, so both guys, a lot of minutes, decent amount of points between two of them. You know, about fifteen, sixteen points between both of them. And, you know, five, six, seven assists between the two of them. So that's a lot of stats. You know, that that's some stuff people are going to have to make up. And like I said, I do think the Lakers are going to be missing both of them. Uh, and but, but does this change, you know, their chances of winning the NBA Finals? Is this 
knocking them out of contention, you know, not having Averly Bradley and Rajon Rondo, both of them, you know, losing both. Uh, I want to say no, it doesn't necessarily change their chance or, or, you know, or their odds in winning the finals. It does make it a little bit harder. Okay. It, it's like I said, it's going, to, it's going to be a harder path. I said that whenever, you know, Bradley opted out in the first place. Uh, uh, and now obviously they'll be missing Rondo for, uh, the most of the postseason run. He, he should be back if the Lakers are still playing. He should be back, you know, by the conference final. So he, he, he still is able to be a part of the postseason run. We'll just miss a whole lot. You know, he'll have to miss a, a two months basically of it. So he's, he's going to be out for a long time. He, that's going to affect like a, them on the court. Uh, but with Rondo more than Bradley, I think it's going to affect the Lakers off of the court. Him as a veteran presence, that's been kind of the highlight of Rondo on this Laker team. Not so much his stats or his performances so much. More, you know, his presence on that bench and on the younger players. So, uh, the Lakers are missing out definitely, but they still have almost, you know, just as good a chance to win the finals. Uh, you know, LeBron, he is the main ball handler, you know, for the Lakers. Uh, despite Rondo being, you know, the best uh, established, you know, registered point guard, LeBron, as we said, you know, this this year especially has moved basically to the point guard position, averaging almost 11 assists per game. He has the ball in his hands, you know, more than anybody else does on the Lakers. So, and rightfully so. But, uh, uh, you know, Rondo usually fills in for LeBron. He'll sub in, and, and then he'll he'll take over the ball-handling role. Whenever Rondo comes in, he usually handles the ball a lot because, you know, LeBron is better off of the ball than Rondo. Rondo's better with the ball in his hand, uh, hands making a play. Uh, but, but like I said, LeBron is the key main ball handler when it, when it's crunch time. You know, Rondo wasn't necessarily going to be the guy with the ball in his hands. We know LeBron is and, and, and would, would have the ball in his hands. So in that sense, you know, not a huge loss. They are simply missing, you know, that backup point guard role. Uh, and Rondo also, also, like I said, the veteran presence and, you know, defensively, not the biggest defender, but, you know, a, a savvy defender, a veteran defender. And like I said, he's been there and done that. He's won a championship, uh, been there, done that. So they're going to miss him in all of that role, all, you know, from all of that, uh, aspect, all those, uh, views. But, you know, they do have an Alex Caruso. A very young, uh, pretty talented guy hasn't necessarily played a whole bunch, uh, but has played a decent amount. Has played, you know, the most he ever has in the NBA to this point. Uh, an exciting player to watch. You know, they call him the Carew Show sometimes, and uh, I think he will have to fill in that backup point guard role for Rajon Rondo. We'll have to step up, and you know, he's better off of the ball than Rondo is. He's a bigger player, so. Uh, defensively, I'm, I don't think he's, he'd be a better defender by any means, but, you know, he'll be able to fill that role as, as Rondo did coming off the bench. And, uh, he won't necessarily be, you know, as savvy as, you know, won't make all the plays Rondo would, but can still make some big splash plays, somewhat of a high IQ player. And when you look at the plus minus of him and LeBron on the court, they have some of the best stats in the league, you know, when, when you increase Caruso's minutes and stuff, but, you know, he plays well on the court with LeBron when in comparison to a guy like Rondo who doesn't always play on the, on the, on, at the same time as LeBron. So I think Caruso will step up and hopefully be able to fill that role. Uh, as far as, you know, filling in for Bradley, uh, I think they said Codwell Pope, uh, is most, uh, Contavious Codwell Pope is most likely gonna be filled into that starting position. So he'll fill in Averly's, uh, starting role. Uh, and KCP, not, not the, not the defensive player by any means, uh, Bradley is, but, uh, close to it on the offensive side. And he is the Lakers percentage wise, you know, their best three point shooter. So, uh, inserting him to the starting role. Uh, our starting lineup, not a bad idea. He can shoot the three ball as good as, or, you know, the best, better than anybody else on the team. He'll be getting more shots, more minutes, more chances. Hopefully KCP can live up to that though, because, 
Uh, we haven't necessarily seen him uh, play, you know, uh, play super well in the biggest moments for L.A. Uh, has been one of their bigger players this season, a- averaging nine and a half points. And like I said, he is their best three-point shooter. So he is the best man, I think, to fill in uh, for him in the starting lineup. They also have, you know, Danny Green, who who sometimes starts uh, as well. So they have Danny Green. They just got J.R. Smith, uh, uh, Dion Waiters. So they are also going to fill in, uh, uh, you know, the off-the-bench role Codwell Pope would usually have. Uh, so Jr. Averly Bra- or Dion Waiters will be kind of filling in that bench role that would ordinarily be uh, held by Pope, maybe Green. Uh, so they also have some backups for the backups. So you know, LA is still, I think, you know, looking like LA. I don't see, like I said, the huge change in odds to win, and uh, I think we all know that the Lakers are going to go as far. You know, as their number one and their number two options will take them. Obviously, I'm talking about LeBron, Anthony Davis. You know, LeBron, obviously, this season, 25 points, about almost 11 assists, 7 rebounds. Changed, you know, roles to the point guard position, has thrived. And he's, you know, in the top three, top two, in MVP, in the MVP race this year. Anthony Davis, we know 26, 27 points, 9, 10 rebounds, getting a block or so a game. He is arguably this year's defensive player of the year, uh, has shined uh, in the brightest stage, you know, he's had yet in his career in Los Angeles, has proven everybody that he is capable of playing, you know, on that high stage in the high level, high stakes games. And, uh, yeah, LA is going to go as far as LeBron James, as Anthony Davis can take them. And, you know, Averly Bradley and, and Rajon Rondo being out, like I said, is not going to have as big a factor on it than a lot of people are saying, in my opinion. You know, when, when Rondo got hurt, I think we saw a lot of people, or a decent amount of people, surprisingly say, you know, uh, uh, this is really going to hurt the Lakers and it's going to knock them out of contention. Uh, I, I gotta disagree with that. Uh, like I said, I, I, they're gonna go as far as LeBron and AD takes them, no matter what. Uh, they're they're still going to need their number three guy to step up. That wasn't always, you know, Bradley or Rondo. So so uh, that hasn't changed. They still need one of the many guys to to be that third guy on any given night. If it's Kyle Kuzma, you know, who's averaging 12 and a half points, four rebounds, a couple of assists a game. But, you know, he's going, he's gone back from that 18, six, uh, 17 points a game down to 12. Obviously, you add Anthony Davis, that you're going to get less touches and he's mainly been coming off of the bench. So, you know, that, that's playing a role to it as well. But Kuzma not having this season, everyone thought he would have him. You know, we, we thought he'd really be the established number three guy on this Laker roster. He really hasn't established himself as that guy quite yet, but he is capable of being that guy on a given night. I also think, you know, Codwell Pope, like I said, their best three-point shooter, almost 10 points a game uh, off the bench usually, uh, is capable of being that third guy on a given night as well. Uh, you know, obviously you're hoping Kuzma can really step up and do that. Uh, but you also have Danny Green, a guy who has been there and done that. You know, he is a reigning champion from that Toronto series last year. Uh, so he has multiple championships from, you know, him and the Raptors, him on the Spurs, has played LeBron many times, knows how LeBron likes to play, has been in the playoffs, you know, has hit the big shots, has played de- defense, you know, at the biggest times and in, in the, you know, the, the the clutchest most key possessions possible so he's been there and done that you know green definitely capable of stepping up in being that third guy also Markeith Morris I think capable of stepping up on a given night so you know Kuzma Codwell Pope Green Morris you know out of those guys you know one of them on a given night are going to have to step up and like I said be that third scoring option uh, because they can't just rely on like I said they, they will go as far as Anthony Davis and LeBron take them uh, but all season when they've had success they've had one of those guys step up and be the number three guy so they need that as well as long as they have that you know I, I see LA still being in contention uh, basically just as you know in contention 
for the championship as they were before these two guys dropped out. I like the additions of Dion Waiters and J.R. Smith. Uh, I like I like the addition of Dion a little more, you know, especially on the offensive side. So I also think Dion and Jr. are also capable of stepping up and being that third scoring option on a given night. Uh, so I'm I'm comfortable, you know, in the Lakers' chances. Uh, uh, they will miss those two guys, you know, like I said, Rondo and Bradley. But but it's the same story in LA. You know, it, it, it's going to be. How far can LeBron James and Anthony Davis take this team? Can the two of them, uh, you know, overcome that loaded Clipper roster? Can they overcome the beast in the East in Giannis? That's still the storyline. It's not uh, Rondo and Bradley stepping up. You know, it's not that they weren't necessarily guys they always counted on all season. Uh, however, we did see Bradley have, you know, the, the, the insane performance against the Clippers right before the season stopped. So who knows? Maybe the loss of those two guys will have a bigger effect than I'm expecting it to have. Uh, however, like I said, I still have L.A. in contention to win the ring, to win the championship this year. They are even my pick to win still. Uh, so I, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this. I'll post a poll. Check it out on Twitter. Check out Facebook. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and take a quick break. When I come back, I want to talk about life in that Orlando bubble. You know, that anonymous quote, quote, snitch uh, hotline. And also what, you know, the play uh, on the court, you know, what we might see in Orlando. So don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. All right, guys, welcome back. Like I said before the break, let's talk about that NBA Orlando bubble. Okay, they've been down in Orlando now, all the teams have, for almost a week now. Uh, Depending on, you know, obviously some players are late to arrive, depending on, you know, COVID tests, personal situations and stuff. So some players haven't quite reported yet, but for the most part, uh, all teams have been in Orlando for about a week or so now, uh, so it's only right that we start hearing about you know one of the one of the guidelines, one of the things we saw that would be implemented when we first you know started hearing about this bubble in Orlando. Uh, I want to talk about the anonymous uh, hotline, uh, you know, to report violations at Disney World. I, I want to talk about that uh, because there have actually been multiple tips, uh, multiple phone calls to this anonymous hotline. Somewhat, I don't want to say snitching, but yeah, you know, telling on these other NBA players, uh, doing things that go against the, you know, guidelines they agreed to before going down to the bubble. Uh, so I want to talk about this. Uh, everyone seems to have an opinion on this. I'm sure, you know, if you're listening to this by now, you've heard a multiple other people's opinions and there seems to be you know two basic sides you know as there is to most things you know there's two sides to every argument and that applies here uh you know one side you know I, i've heard a whole lot of people saying you know the people who called that hotline they're they are you know they're snitches you know plain and simple they snitched uh 
Uh, no, no respect. They said the hotline is bad. Uh, we've heard players like Dinwiddie come out and say, despite not being in the bubble, him come out and say, you know, don't use it. Don't, don't snitch. Don't tell on the other players. Uh, people like uh, Rudy Gobert came out and said, uh, you know, he, he doesn't think this is a good idea. He doesn't like it. Uh, so, so that's one side, you know, you, you don't like it. You think people who, who are using it are snitches and it's no good. Okay. That, that's basically one side. The other side, it's good. Okay. It, it, it's, it's there, you know, it, it's there to keep the players safe. That's the whole point. It's there. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're simply trying to protect all those players and, you know, the people in the bubble, uh, and especially the ones who are in contention for the championship, you know, obviously some people are taking this more serious than others. You know, a player on the Lakers is definitely taking it, or the Clippers or the Bucks are definitely taking this more seriously than, uh, or I don't want to say more seriously, but you know, they have more to lose in this sense, in, in the, in the bubble, uh, not with their lives or anything like that, but you know, in their career, or this season, you know, they have more to lose than a team than a player on the Kings or a player on the Wizards or something. Okay, so a team that is in contention in comparison to a team that isn't. Uh, so the teams that are definitely have more to lose in this sense. And in my opinion, they should be looking out for more things, you know, than the teams that aren't in contention. Uh, uh, so those are the two basic sides, you know, uh, they're snitches, it's bad, don't use it, or it's good, it should be encouraged, and it's keeping players safe. Those are the two sides. And I want to start out by saying, I understand both sides. I, I definitely get where both, both sides are coming from, okay? Players, you know, for, for the fact for on, on the side that people are saying it's bad and the people are snitches and stuff, you know, players could potentially make false claims, you know, to benefit themselves and their team. When in, just in a situation, let's say a player on the Bucks see a see a player on the on Toronto doing something they shouldn't, and they know, you know, Toronto more than any other team in the East is giving you know the Bucks a run for their money. So I'm going to go ahead and let the league know what that player on Toronto. Toronto's doing, you know, just just an example for you. So players could potentially use it for personal gain rather than, you know, the original use, the purpose, which is to keep everybody safe. So that's one portion. We, we, we could see people misusing this and using it for their own personal gain. Uh, but, you know, it is in place, like I said, to keep them safe. Uh, on the other side, you know, it would be super awkward It'd be super awkward to come to find out, you know, when, when you find out this player ratted on this player, uh, for doing something. You know what I mean? Uh, so, so that, that's another aspect to it. You know, uh, very awkward. You gotta think about, you know, the, the effects it might have long term on your relationship, maybe with this player or with the entire league. You know, your rep with the entire league. Uh, I know a guy like D'Angelo Russell, a guy who, who, you know, uh, I don't want to say snitched, but yeah, kind of snitched on Nick Young. Uh, well, I don't think what Nick Young was doing, I don't want to comment or, you know, give too much context on what actually happened. But obviously, we, we saw D'Angelo Russell get traded from Los Angeles in large part to do with the controversy in the locker room. He somewhat snitched on a player for him in his personal life, what he was doing in his personal life. Uh, we, we've seen that is somewhat his reputation in the league today. Despite if, you know, if what Nick was doing was right or wrong, uh, you know, players are, are there, are quick to defend Nick and, and oppose D'Angelo for, for leaking the information from Nick's personal life. Uh, so we know the long-term effect it can have when you get the snitch, uh, title on you or, you know, you, you get that. Uh, people think of you as that. Uh, we've seen it, like I said, with D'Angelo Russell and if hopefully it doesn't get out, who, who have put in the phone calls, but if it does, I do think it could get pretty awkward, uh, you know, when it comes out who leaked on who. But again, you know, what if these players are doing something they shouldn't be doing, bringing somebody in the bubble, getting outside food brought in, even though, you know, they're not necessarily supposed to do that quite yet. So, so there are many factors that come, that come into it. Hopefully the, the anonymous tips were placed 
you know, or, you know, in truth, they were factual. They did, in fact, see somebody breaking the rules. I really hope it wasn't for, you know, a personal gain, simply, you know, false claims, trying to help them and their, and their team, their situation, opposed to, again, the, the real purpose, which is to keep the players safe, uh, from that virus, from the pandemic. Uh, overall, my opinion on this matter, you know, is that I am, I'm cool with the anonymous hotline. I'm cool with players calling in, I know I'm not a snitch. I, I don't believe in, in, in ratting someone out for personal gain by any means. I am for, however, you know, saying something when someone is doing, you know, the wrong thing, doing something that could in fact hurt me or my career or, or someone that I care about. If you're doing something that, that could, that, that jeopardizes me and, and my career. And like I said, someone I am close to. Yes. You best believe I'm choosing myself, you know, over you in, in that sense. If you are are causing potential harm to other people uh, uh, when you, you don't have to. Uh, so I'm cool with the anonymous hotline as as long as it's being used uh, truthfully, truthfully and in the right context, in the right way. Players shouldn't just jump, uh, you know, on board, jump to conclusions with certain players. They need to make sure when they are calling, it is factual and they are calling for you know they it, it is for a a violation for the guidelines you know they shouldn't be calling for for stupid things or like i said things that will simply help them in personal uh gain for in their career or their team uh so as long as it's getting used correctly i'm on board for it and i think it should be used keep those players safe i want to make sure we we can continue the bubble and have a a an nba champion this year that's that's strictly why i want to keep everyone safe and make sure we can in fact get a champion uh another thing let's somewhat segue same you know somewhat topic in the orlando bubble but, you know, a, a different segment in this topic. So uh, uh, another thing getting discussed right now, players like Chris Middleton, OK, uh, Pascal Siakam come out and said they haven't played basketball during the hiatus. They didn't touch a ball in months. Uh, you know, that's a little bit alarming when, you know, obviously for basketball players out there, you know, you know, the best possible way to get in basketball shape to be ready to play high level basketball is by playing basketball ha having the ball in your hands okay and that's the biggest way to get prepared uh and if big stars like middleton and siakam come out have come out and said they didn't touch a ball uh, i'm sure there are other players out there in the exact same situation that haven't necessarily come out and said it uh, I think another player like Jason Tatum came out and said he didn't really play much. Uh, Giannis, at a point, said he, he hadn't played in a couple of weeks, if not a month. So I'm sure that he got back on the court. But still, players like Middleton and Siakam haven't touched a ball in months. Uh, not everyone, though. You know, I, I do want to give them a little bit of slack. I don't think they were necessarily, you know, simply being lazy, not playing. Maybe, you know, they have family members that were ill or higher chance of getting the virus and they simply wanted to be safe uh maybe they, they didn't have the the ability to go to a gym or a facility since facilities were closed gyms were closed schools were closed so a lot of players didn't necessarily have a chance to go to a gym if they don't have a court or, you know a driveway and a, and a basketball hoop at their house not every player has that you know some players might live in lofts apartments uh, uh condos i don't know but you don't know every single player's situation not every player has the same setup you know as a lebron james has a, a basketball court at his house and, and a, a full facility you know on site basically so not everyone has uh the same benefits as other players do so like i said if players like middleton and siakam haven't played i bet there are many other players in that same situation okay will this have an effect on the quality of play in orlando will the first couple of games rounds be not the best play not the best level of basketball we've seen you know not especially not you know this the same level we saw right before uh the hiatus the stoppage of play 
Uh, I do think everyone should have the correct expectations. Don't expect uh, the the usual NBA finals, usual NBA postseason in this sense. Don't necessarily expect that right from the get go. Uh, people should have their expectations, you know, in the right space. Uh, they should expect the right thing. Don't expect, like I said, the best play right away. Uh, however, I do think you know it's going to be somewhat obvious which players kept in shape and, and, and played, uh, you know, kept playing the game while they were on, on leave, uh, and which players didn't. I think it's going to be pretty obvious in play. You know, guys like, we've seen pictures of guys like uh, Zion, uh, LeBron, they just look like they're in, uh, James Harden, they look like they're in, in great shape. Uh, they seem to be, they seem to have put the work in, you know, during the off, somewhat off season of, of this, you know, three, four month, uh, break they got. So they seem, like I said, Zion, LeBron, James Harden, they seem, you know, just from their bodies, just looking for, at them, they seem to put, to have put in the work, you know, while being at home, uh, not necessarily something we, all players, uh, have done. So I do think it's going to be pretty obvious which players have been playing and which players have not been playing. Hopefully though, you know, after the eight seeding games, possibly the play in tournament, we see, uh, you know, playoff basketball again. They're, they're getting a couple of weeks. You know, like I said, players are there right now. The first games, the games don't start until July 30th. So they have a couple more weeks to get back in basketball shape after the eight seeding games and by the postseason. I do have faith that we will see high level basketball, a, a high level play. Uh, however, at, the, at the get go, at the beginning, I don't think you should expect a fantastic play uh, right away. I, I do think they will edge themselves into it, and we will see high-level postseason in the NBA again this season. Hopefully, Chris Middleton, Pascal Siakam have have got the ball on the court. You know, since getting to Orlando, hopefully they are getting back into the swing of things. Uh, and either way, a couple of weeks, July thirtieth, we got basketball back. I'm going to take a quick break. When I come back, a little bit about this year's NBA draft. I want to talk about one of the top prospects in LaMelo Ball, where he might land in the draft. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G smcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back, guys. Like I said before the break, I want to talk about LaMelo Ball, you know, one of this year's uh, projected lottery picks. Uh, I want to talk about where I think he might land and where I think uh, he should go, you know, what would be best for him. Uh, obviously, like I said, he's, he's a top lottery pick. We've been watching LaMelo Ball, at least I've been watching uh, LaMelo Ball uh, for years now. You know, I, I feel like I've been watching him since he was... I think I was watching him and since, since he was a freshman or around a freshman in high school, he was playing varsity basketball, you know, with his two older brothers. Uh, I simply remember him, you know, playing very well, being super young, uh, but playing up with his two older brothers. Uh, so I think I've been watching him, uh, you know, all the way, you know, you know, back then. So that's at least four or five years ago by now. Uh, so I've been watching him for years now, uh, but now, you know, it's finally time 
for him to get drafted, you know, into the NBA. Uh, he, he declared for the NBA draft, you know, right after his NBL season. Uh, so he's declared he is going to the draft. As far as what he did, you know, in the NBL league in Australia, National Basketball League in Australia, uh, he averaged 17 points, seven rebounds, and about or, or yeah, seven rebounds and about seven assists. Also had a steal and a half per game. Uh, obviously, being 18 years old, he was one of the younger players in that league. Uh, so, so playing very well, being, uh, you know, the team, one of the team's leaders, you know, uh, 17.7 rebounds and seven assists is a very even stat line doing a little bit or, or quite a bit of everything. It seems like also getting a steal and a half per game. And, you know, you know, LaMelo is a point guard, but he's six foot six, if not maybe six foot seven by now, you know, he's a very tall, lengthy point guard. Uh, so that's going to help him on the defensive side when he does match up against some smaller point guards. Uh, so, so there are some pros for, for LaMelo. And, and the team that I would, I don't want to say I, I'm like hoping or I, I'm really hoping he gets drafted by them, but the team I do think he will inevitably be, or inevitably be drafted by is the New York Knicks, okay? They have said they are interested in him. He, I know he's interested in going uh, to the Garden, you know, one of the biggest franchises in the NBA. So I know he would be interested in going there. Uh, I know the Knicks were interested in him. Uh, and it just seems, it seems right, you know, a uh, big stage, LaMelo Ball being a big star, and, and the Knicks needing uh, a player or players, you know, to put butts in seats. You know, fans are going to Nick games either way, but they're going to usually watch the opposing team beat the Knicks, and usually by the end of the game, the Knicks fans are cheering for the other team. And that's not really what you want for your franchise. Uh, yes, you're selling a lot of tickets and people are going to your games because you're in New York. Uh, you can't really live off that or write off, you know, your location forever, though. Uh, that's a franchise that needs big names. You know, ever since the big name of Carmelo Anthony left, that hasn't necessarily been a relevant franchise. Uh, and, and we remember uh, uh, years back, uh, years back when they drafted Porzingis, okay, they drafted Porzingis, a lesser known guy, not really somebody everybody in the league or that watched basketball knew. So the, uh, with the fourth pick in the 2015 draft, you know, they got Kristaps Porzingis, the international player, uh, uh, and we heard the Knicks fans at the draft booing the decision, booing Kristaps. Uh, so in this Nick franchise, not afraid to let the franchise or the fans, not afraid to let the franchise, the organization, you know, know what they think. Uh, and like I said, a franchise that wants big names. We heard this past year, all year, you know, the Knicks tanking for Zion. They want Zion. We also heard, you know, KD, Kyrie, they're leaving their respective teams. They're leaving Golden State. They're leaving Boston. They're teaming up in New York. They're going to the New York Knicks. Uh, uh, Anthony Davis, we heard a lot last year too. You know, the Knicks have a package involved for Anthony Davis. Uh, so when you're talking about the Knicks, you are also talking about them not in contention whatsoever necessarily but them wanting these big all-star names so that's usually what you hear what you think of with the new york knicks but not always do not really ever do they have you know the biggest name in sports or you know one of the biggest names or you know in the league carmelo was one of the exceptions patrick ewing obviously uh was you know their home run and, and the the lightest point of that entire franchise you know when it was uh ran with you know Ewing so so or led by Patrick Ewing so you know they haven't really been relevant since Carmelo a team that really wants you know big names uh you know like I said they booed Kristaps a lesser known guy at the draft last or, or in 2015 uh LaMelo is easily the biggest name uh, in this year's draft, LaMelo Ball, like I said, we've, we've been talking about him. We've been watching him play for years. In large part, you know, his family, Lonzo Ball, his dad, LeVar Ball, you know, a big personality. Haven't heard from him so much in sports because people are 
kind of getting tired of him, got tired of him, but uh, big personality. He's, he's, he's got some big things to say, big statements to put out there. He's not afraid to say it. You know, he, he will, quote, you know, speak it into a, existence. Uh, so, you know, what a bigger name to draft than LaMelo Ball if you have the opportunity to. And, you know, with the Knicks management really being in question uh, lately, uh, especially with the trade of Chris Stops, you know, obviously no Carmelo, not getting a whole lot in return for Porzingis. So, so the organization itself has been in question. Uh, you know, who is running this team, especially the owner? Uh, so I do think drafting LaMelo Ball would help the Knicks organization, especially with, you know, the fans. Uh, like I said, they booed Porzingis, a lesser known name. They get the biggest name possible in this year's draft in LaMelo Ball. Also, that team, it's no doubt, you know, that team is needing an established, they're needing a starting point guard. They're needing a leader, you know, to put all of their young pieces together. They're also looking, you know, for their coach, their, their leader to lead these young guys. I hear, uh, Tom Thibodeau, I did a segment on it, you know, weeks back, but right now the biggest name out there, or the, the most frequent name we're hearing is Tom Thibodeau for this team. I would really like to see a Kenny Atkinson get the, get the role. Uh, but Tom is right now in, in lead. He's the lead runner for the job. It's apparently his to lose. Uh, but either way, the team is looking for, you know, their next leader, their next franchise player, getting a scorer in RJ Barrett last year. They have Julius Randle locked up for a few years. You know, Randle's averaging 20 points, nine, or, uh, 20 points, 10 rebounds. Barrett almost 15 points. They got young players like Robinson and Kevin Knox who simply need to pop Dennis Smith Jr. as well. So what a better leader or piece to plug in than the mellow ball. He can pass, shoot, and rebound. Not so much of a selfish player as he used to be. Obviously averaging, you know, seven assists, a steal and a half per game. So uh, a big and lengthy point guard as well on the defensive end uh, that that can, you know, that's going to favor a whole lot of matchups on the defensive end as well. Uh, So I like LaMelo in New York and makes sense for him to go to the Knicks. Like I said, box office, you know, they need a big name to put butts in seats. What better than a ball brother, LaMelo Ball? We saw when Lonzo went to the Lakers, big deal. Now LaMelo goes to New York, another big deal. Another big franchise gets a ball brother. Uh, so it's going to be storylines all season. Uh, they need a leader. Why not go ahead and take a chance on the biggest name, possibly that has who has the biggest upside in this year's draft in the Mellow Ball. So that's my that's my take on the Knicks. Okay, and that's where I do think he will probably go. That's kind of where I kind of hope he goes. But do I think that is what's best for the Mellow Ball? Not necessarily. I will get his name out there, recognition, jerseys, yes. But what about, you know, the Detroit Pistons? Another team needing a point guard and will, who will also be in the lottery this year. We've heard RJ Hampton get tossed out for, get, get tossed out there for a possible pick for the Pistons, but, you know, they're needing a point guard. You know, they also have a lottery pick. They're looking for a player for the future. They just traded Andre Drummond, you know, got rid of that cap. They got some cap space, so they're looking for their next franchise player. They just hired Troy Weaver, you know, the the operations, the the, uh, front office guy from the Oklahoma City Thunder. He is responsible for drafting, you know, Russell Westbrook. He is responsible for, for trading uh, uh, Russell Westbrook, you know, or to the Rockets for Chris Paul, a move, you know, that, that has worked out well for that team. He, he is, he's, he's in charge of the, the trade of, of Paul George, the Clippers getting all of those picks, Gilgis Alexander, Gallinari. So he is responsible for pulling off that trade. Yes, the Clippers would basically give anything to get the guy in Paul George, the co-star to Kawhi Leonard, but he, Troy Weaver is the man in OKC who pulled it off, and we see OKC now, uh, a team not necessarily we saw doing as well as they are. Okay, they're doing much better than we thought them than we thought they would have done, you know, at the beginning of the season. Uh, large part to do with that man Troy Weaver putting those pieces together, and uh, they've they've clicked better than you know anyone really saw coming. He is in large part uh, to deal with that. 
also, you know, they, they have their coach, it seems like, obviously, you know, in uh, uh, Dwayne Casey. They have, obviously, you know, their, their front office seems to be more stable than the New York Knicks franchise. And, you know, they're still looking for their head coach. So, so thing, things just seem to be more set in stone in Detroit. They seem to have a better game plan. Uh, and they also have, you know, a, a star in Blake Griffin. Like I said, some cap space. Also, obviously, the lottery pick this year. So I would like, also like to see him going to, you know, a little bit of a smaller stage in Detroit in comparison to New York. Uh, a little bit of a better ran franchise, more established pieces, uh, and like an established game plan. So I would like to see him going to Detroit. He might end up having a better career, like a more uh, stable career. It's, it's a more stable environment for the young LaMelo Ball, having a lot going on in his personal life and with his family at the least part. So, uh, you know, with that family, we know we know them. So uh, a stable place would be good for him, which I think Detroit would give him. However, box office, big, big money, you know, endorsement deals, that's the New York Knicks, uh, you know, bigger stage. You're playing in the garden. Uh, so, so a bigger stage in New York. I do think the Knicks should go ahead and get him if possible. I could also see the New York Knicks passing on him and, and, and the Pistons getting him somewhat in a steel fashion. So I would like to see him going to either place. The Pistons might be a more stable franchise, but the Knicks, like I said, more of a box office pick and a box office move. So he could go either way. Uh, those are the places that I want to see him go. If either one of those places, I'm pretty much you know okay with New York, uh, the Pistons. I would I'd be happy to see him go to uh, Phoenix. I think they need a, an established point guard. Him getting paired with Booker and, and Aiton might be a, a three, you know, a big three in the making possibly. Uh, so. No matter where he goes, you know, uh, you know, stability will help him. I think he'll get that in Detroit. We'll see. The draft is going to happen. Uh, I think it's going to it's set to oct- go on, and you know, towards the end of October, middle to end of October. So we got plenty of time to talk about the draft and break down all the prospects. We're going to go ahead and start talking about it right now. Uh, Let me know what you guys think as well in the comment section, in the review section. I'm going to go ahead and take a quick break. When I come back, my final segment, I will be covering, yes, the Golden State Warriors, the trade for Andrew Wiggins, and if they are, in fact, still in contention you know, for a championship going forward. Don't miss it. I'll be right back. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Alright guys, like I said before the break, this is going to be my final segment of the day, and I want to talk about those Golden State Warriors, okay? Uh, uh, the Andrew Wiggins trade, and if in fact they are still, con- excuse me, contenders for the NBA title going forward, okay? Excuse me. Uh, so the Warriors, uh, let's go back, okay? Let, let's go back to where this started. So last year's off season, the Warriors acquired D'Angelo Russell in a sign and trade with the Brooklyn Nets, you know, sending Kevin Durant to Brooklyn. D'Angelo Russell goes to Golden State. Uh, so they acquired D'Angelo Russell from the Nets. The Warriors then trade D'Angelo Russell in the middle to end of the season for Andrew Wiggins in a first round and a second round pick. Okay, 
So when the move did happen, I remember, you know, specifically, of course, I remember, you know, they got a lot of heat. Not a lot of people liked the move. I was different. You know, I, I, I for, for the longest time, I was a Wiggins. I was not an Andrew Wiggins lover or a supporter. Uh, however, right after the trade went through, I, I analyzed it. I really thought long and hard about it. And I think the, the Warriors did the right thing. Okay, they needed a forward, not a guard. Okay, D'Angelo Russell, you know, obviously an all-star caliber player. I really like what he can do with the ball, but he is a ball dominant, uh, ball dominant uh, point guard. Okay, and that is going to take the ball away from Steph, from Clay, from Draymond, guys who do also need the ball. Okay, so uh, I do think Wiggins is is a is filling a need uh, when D'Angelo Russell was more of a uh, uh, pride, uh, more of a. Mm, a treat, okay. He wasn't necessarily feeling a need, but he's an all-star player who can go score, okay. He's 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 a, he's a nice treat. He's a nice benefit, but he's not feeling a need, okay. They needed a forward. Uh, like I said, people were questioning the the D'Angelo Russell signing from the get-go. Right after they traded him, uh, Steve Kerr came out and said, you know, yeah, me myself, you know, I questioned the move. I think everyone questioned the move all season, uh, so. I don't think it was uh, a a surprise when they ended up trading him uh, for Wiggins. Uh, maybe it was a surprise they traded uh, you know him before the, the off season because him with this lottery pick might end up getting you more possibly than just Andrew Wiggins. But uh, either way, Wiggins fills the role you know at small forward. Because at the small forward position, okay, they lost Kevin Durant. They lost Andre Iguodala, two guys who can do it on the offensive side just as well as, you know, the defensive side. Uh, so the Warriors were missing a lot of offense and a lot of defense with those two players missing in the lineup. Uh, Wiggins is a career 20-point, four-rebound uh, a night guy, so he he can fill in, uh, you know, the lack of scoring you're missing from from the Kevin Durant. Okay, obviously he's not going to get you 27 a game like KD, but you know Steph can still get you 25, 26. Clay can get you 24, 25, and then you simply need Wiggins to get you the 18 to 20 points he's gotten his entire career. Uh, when he when he went to Golden State, okay, right after the, he only played. Uh, 10 to 12 games, you know, after the trade, before the hiatus. But in Golden State, his shooting percentage rose. Okay, so his, his percentage went up. His steals and blocks went up from not even one a game to averaging one and a half steals and blocks per game. Uh, not a guy known for his defense in Andrew Wiggins. However, right when that trade went through, we saw the Warriors organization saying, we need him more on defense than we do on offense. Uh, so so we knew defense was going to be a role, was going to be a, a, a place where Wiggins would have to really study and, and grind uh, defensively. And I think he did that right from the get-go. Obviously, we saw the increase, like I said, in steals and blocks, and he shot a more efficient percentage percentage from the floor from the three and from the floor so his his scoring might have went down but obviously he wasn't the focal point wasn't getting as many shots you know in, in Minnesota he was he was Minnesota as well as Carl Anthony Towns but you know before Carl Anthony Towns he had the expectation of a number one scorer uh, to be you know a star in this league we know that is we now know that isn't necessarily what Wiggins is that isn't where he's going to thrive He's going to thrive being a third or fourth option, you know, simply needing to get 16 to 18 points a night, and that is what he's going to do in Golden State. Uh, you know, Kerr, he said it himself. Like I said, they don't need him to be a number one or a number two. They're simply needing him to be a three or four man on this roster, uh, and, and I think it was, I think, Wiggins should thrive in the role, you know, with Steph, Clay, and Draymond. And I think it was a good trade for both Minnesota 
and the Warriors because Minnesota, you know, for a long time, we, I, I, for some reason, I've heard, you know, they have, they wanted, they had interest in D'Angelo Russell. Him, Carl Anthony Towns have a history. They are, the two of them are good friends. Uh, so we knew, you know, there was a link between Russell and Minnesota. Uh, so it was, I'm glad he is hooking up with his friend down there. Uh, so I'm glad for them getting their point guard. And like I said, the Warriors are filling a need at the small forward position. So I'm happy for both teams in this trade. Now, let's talk about uh, the other aspect I said I wanted to talk about. Are the Golden State Warriors still contenders You know, going forward for the championship? I'm going to come right out and say yes. Yes, they are still in contention to win a championship in the coming years. I give their window three to four years. You know, that that's their peak. That's their window to win another championship, at least another three years. In large part, you know, I can't write them off when they have Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green. Yes, they still have all three of those guys. And if you don't, if you if you don't remember those three guys, obviously Kevin Durant was there for a large part of it. But those three guys, they went to five straight finals. Again, KD was a huge part, huge factor in winning all of those finals. Uh, uh, but either way, uh, you know, Clay, Draymond, Steph, all vital pieces to that. Three huge pieces to that. And and you know, when you look at records with KD, with all them, they have a a a winning record when KD is hurt, when KD sits. However, the Warriors had a losing record when Steph, Clay, or Draymond sat. So if those three guys are out, chances are, you know, they're going to lose the ball game. In in contrary to where Kevin is out, they have a better they still have a good chance of winning the game, winning the series. So that's an, that's that's a, a stat that shouldn't be overrated or underrated. Okay, just just want to bring that out. Uh, and you know, like I said, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson. In my opinion, that's the best backcourt in NBA history. Two of the best shooters in NBA history. And Steph, in, in my opinion, he is still in his prime. Okay, he still has something left to prove. In my opinion, uh, you know, without Kevin Durant, that he is still an All NBA player, and he was just as big a part to the championships as Kevin was. Uh, so Steph still has years left. You know, his last year healthy in 2018, 2019, he averaged 27 points, five assists, five rebounds, 43% from the three, like 47, 48% from the field. So we know what Steph is capable of doing. We saw his MVP year averaging over 30 points a game. So we know what he's capable of doing, and I think he's still capable of that going forward. Uh, Clay, I think Clay was playing some of the best basketball of his career before he tore his ACL in the finals, you know, especially in that final series when he was playing, he, he, he was, you know, when he was on the court, they had a chance. Okay. It was clear when Steph and Clay were both out there and Draymond, all three of them, they had a chance. It was, it was the, the lack of Clay throughout the entire season. Obviously the lack of Kevin Durant, but the lack of Clay that really took him out when Clay was playing, like I said, some of the best basketball averaging 26, 27 points a game Clay was. So, some of the best basketball Clay was playing before he got hurt. Uh, uh, a story came out uh, yesterday that uh, Steve Kerr says, you know, Clay Thompson's looking like his ordinary self. He's back to his old self, hitting shots from all over the court. So that's great to hear. Uh, so Kerr is saying he is back. He's basically back to, you know, old Clay, back to the old form. He was playing, you know, the peak level he was playing at. Before the injury, obviously he has to get back in game uh, shape. Playing basketball is the only way you know you, you get better, and, and obviously you're in that shape. So he's going to get better playing five on five and such. Not something he can do right now, but either way, Kerr said he's looking like his old self. As far as Draymond goes, you know, a guy who's gotten a whole lot of disrespect over the past couple of years. Uh, really undervalued. People are really forgetting, you know, how big a role he really had on the Warriors, especially pre KD. Okay, he was top twelve, top ten in the MVP race uh, before Kevin Durant gets there. Some people were even saying he was a bigger part of the team, a bigger role, more important to the team than Steph was. Okay, so he is 
a very valuable player. He should not be an undervalued guy. He has come out and said, you know, I got to get back to my 15, 16 uh, Draymond, you know, 2015, 2016 Draymond, some of the best basketball he was playing. Uh, he said he said himself, he's going to come back, prove the haters wrong. So he's got a chip on his shoulder. Uh, obviously, now they have Wiggins as a third or fourth option, that's not bad on your team when Andrew Wiggins is your third or fourth guy, or your fourth guy. Also, they have a lottery pick, uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this offseason. They have a lottery pick from Minnesota next offseason. So they have ammunition, simply don't that have that much cap space. But either way, you know, they have ammunition. They have guys, and they are setting themselves up, you know, to to be right back there in contention. And yes, when you have Steph, Clay, Draymond, uh, uh, yes, I'm I'm putting you, you know, name me more teams, you know, name me some teams you're taking over that team. Are you going to take, you know, the Rockets? I, I've seen them beat the Houston Rockets, so that that that's a toss up. Maybe the Lakers are a toss up. The Clippers are a toss up. Clippers are, are favorited against them, but you know uh, when you're comparing them to like a a Jazz team or or a Trailblazer team or a Dallas Maverick team or these other playoff teams, uh, I'm picking the Warriors any day over them, and, and I might even pick them over the the other contending teams that I just listed. So I think they they are in position to be right back in contention to win championships. I I am very comfortable in saying you know I I am very very comfortable in saying that the Golden State Warriors will win another championship. You know, this core guy, Steph, Clay, Draymond, they have one more championship run left in them. I can't wait to see it happen. I think the window is, like I said, three years, three, maybe four, probably closer to three. Uh, we'll see if they can get it done. I would love to hear your guys' opinion on the Warriors going forward. Uh, either way, that's going to do it for today's episode you know, of the GSMC Basketball Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, I want to urge you to follow us on or, you know, on, uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, all of our social media pages. Please leave us a nice review or rating. Uh, and, and, and from me, I want to say thank you for the continued support. Uh, please continue to support our hosts here at GSMC, Bryce, Nick, myself. Continue to watch and listen to our podcast. We're giving you the most recent and up-to-date news in the, on the NBA and just basketball as a whole. So again, thank you for listening. I'll see you guys again next week. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.